I said, Stuart, I'm just, you're all set up, fantastic. I'm just going to go and get a coffee. Is that okay? And he said, yeah, would you mind taking these? And gave me two really quite odd-looking tubes filled with unidentified material. Could you just go and put a couple of drops of dishwashing detergent in that for me? That would be great. And so I had to go and order a coffee and then say, could I get some dishwashing detergent in these two random jars of unidentifiable liquid? And they went, help yourself. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to explode or what. Would you please make him very, very welcome, Stuart Prescott. So good morning, and thank you for your patience and your assistance, and I hope you had a wonderful time at ANSTO yesterday. You had some quality time with some of Australia's finest scientists and some of Australia's finest police officers. But I hope you, what you found was some sort of practical application and, and have a better idea of what I was talking about when I said neutron scattering, when I said neutron diffraction. So today I want to pursue our story a little bit further. We got halfway through our story. We, started to, we built ourselves a toolkit about measurement. We tried to think how we would measure things about molecules. The question now is how do we make use of those measurements to try and have a way of really learning something practically useful about the assemblies of molecules, the way that we can get molecules to help us do what we want to achieve, not just fulfill the purposes that are there, there and are quite happy to do, but how we get molecules to really do something useful for us. Now, we, we went through this process of, of designing a measurement toolkit yesterday. We talked about neutron diffraction, we talked about diffraction in general. We pulled together some various different ideas about having a reactor, having a source of neutrons allowed us to probe structure. And it allowed us to probe structure at that nanometer to 100 nanometer level. Bigger than atoms, we're not talking about carbon-carbon bonding here and the things that a chemist gets interested in. We're talking about one step larger. We're talking about things where we have the, the collections of molecules forming larger, more interesting things. So today, having talked about big toys yesterday, I now want to apply big toys to tiny molecules. And one of the things that you might have realised in our, our tour through ANSTO yesterday is that the smaller the thing you want to probe, the bigger the toy you need. So at the stage where we're starting to ask questions about collections of molecules, we needed really, really big toys at ANSTO. If you want to start probing even more details of subatomic particles, then you make even bigger toys again, and all of a sudden you end up with the Large Hadron Collider, and that's a seriously, seriously big toy. So what we want to do today is to pull together some of our ideas about, what, about chemistry. We want to talk about some molecules. We want to think about what molecules want to do and why molecules want to interact with interfaces. So surface chemistry, interfacial chemistry, is what I really enjoy. It's what I really like. Trying to work out why molecules stick to interfaces is a really interesting problem. Trying to work out what properties of molecules make that happen and also how we can tune those effects. That's where a lot of really, really interesting chemistry occurs. That's chemistry that appears all through your daily life. So we'll see molecules that you used in your toothpaste this morning, things that are effectively a soap that's in your toothpaste, in your shampoo, in the little hand gel stuff that you used as you walked in. And that's got fantastic rheological properties. The viscosity of that hand gel stuff, the way it squirts out and doesn't just run through your fingers, that's impressive chemical engineering in a bottle. So that's the sort of stuff that I want to talk about today, that I want to start building upon our ideas of size and structure and build upwards from our neutron scattering experiments that we've done. But before I do that, Chris has asked me to talk a little bit about how I ended up back here 20 years after I was last here, figuratively speaking, not in this fancy, shiny new building. So I was on the other side of this in 1995, and I pulled off my, uh, um, off my bookshelf the other day, Breakthrough, Creativity and Progress in Science. Yeah, I still got the book. Why wouldn't you still have the book? It's a fantastic book. There's chapters in there written by an amazing collection of people who had done so many fancy things. I absolutely loved it as a, as a scholar, and uh, that took me into a science degree. I was probably, I mean, I was obviously already heading in that direction, but that confirmed my ideas about what I really wanted to do in a science degree. It actually also to told me where I wanted to do it. 
I really enjoyed my time here at, at ISS. And I came back to do summer research projects and then uh, a, a science degree here at the University of Sydney. So like a good science degree, I studied things like chemistry, maths, computing, physics. And one of the things that I learned through my degree, actually, is that you can never have too much maths in your degree. It's such a toolkit that underlies everything. I could walk into a chemical engineering lecture now, and I look through the notes, and I go, right, I know that maths. And I'm teaching slightly different stuff. I'm talking about fluid flow, for instance. It's maths. It's the same set of equations, the same differential equation, different symbols. But those classical differential equations, the heat equation, the wave equation, these are a, a differential equations that you would learn about in a maths course, you learn about in a physics course, and the chemical engineer needs to know them as well. The mechanical engineer needs to know them. So all of these sorts of things pop up again and again. So you can't have enough maths, and you can't have enough computing. So everything that I do now in my research is very, very computing-based. You saw the scale and complexity of... The, uh, the, the facilities out at Ansto. Each of those instruments is actually run by a bank of computers. Every single instrument needs to know to millimetre or micron or submicron precision where the beam stop is, where the detector is, where the sample, sample rack is, how high the sample stage is. So Behind all of this is some very, very fancy computing that each different bit's got its own computer that runs it, and you actually start programming the instrument. Move here, make this measurement, move here, change the temperature, move here, make this measurement. So having that level of computing to be able to run the instrument, really useful. Having even more to then be able to analyse your data, even better. One of the things that, uh, that we're, we're terribly bad at these days is teaching students that Excel is a wonderful tool for analysing data. And it has to be said that something like Excel would be the McDonald's of data analysis tools. You know it's everywhere, you know it's consistent, and it's consistently crap. <laughs> okay. So it's fine for some things. If you have three points and you want to plot them and look at if they're on a straight line, that's great. But anything more sophisticated than that, you need real data analysis tools. And that requires a little bit more computing smarts and a little bit more maths. So having real data analysis tools is great. And that's the sort of things that you start picking up as you study things like computer science as well. Now, I didn't just come to one ISS. I kept coming back. So I came back as a staffy on ISS 97. And in fact, I think ISS 97 was the first time that we did one of these. <laughs> so ISS 97, I was a staffie there, had a fantastic time as a staffie, and came back again for ISS 99. And ISS 99 was a very, it was a forwards looking, but also a very inter interesting retrospective looking ISS. Millennium Science, what have we achieved in 100 years? the 20th century, what's still to come, and what comes next. And I dug through the photo archive and found a few little random photos of uh, people doing things with uh, lecture theatre equipment that they probably shouldn't be doing. Uh, we went down to the Optical Fibre Technology Centre and were playing around with various bits of optical equipment, and a group of staffies sitting in the, the dining hall at St John's College. Uh, that was our, our final night bash. Everybody poshed up, and that was the, the end of ISS for us. So I kept coming back because I had so much fun. One of the reasons why I kept coming back was that I was starting to enjoy communicating science a lot as well. And so I actually delivered a lecture and two pracs at ISS 99 too. And we, the, 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 I even found the PowerPoint deck for that last night as I was sort of trying to find a couple of extra bits to insert in here. Polymers and adhesives are sticky subjects. So I haven't actually moved on very far. I'm going to talk about why molecules stick to things again today. Polymers and adhesives. What we did in this, we, I talked about polymers, I talked about synthesis, talked about why molecules stick. And then we went down to the chemistry labs and we made a whole lot of polymers. And each group did some synthesis tested out some glues. They were making glues, wood glues. Each group tested out their glues and then fed their information on to the next group and said, 
these were the recipes that worked, these were the recipes that didn't work, this is what we maybe should do next. And so it was like a little set of mini research projects as it worked through. And it actually worked so well as an activity that we ended up writing it up for the Journal of Chemical Education. And about 18 months afterwards, we published a write-up of this particular activity that we'd done at ISS. So communicating science and teaching science was something that I was really enjoying, and polymers was something that I was really enjoying as well. And so Bob Gilbert, who I was working with at the time as a research student, and I had done summer projects with in the past before that, I went on to do a PhD with him, and we, we continued to look at polymers, not so much as, as adhesives, but polymers more generally. Now, at the same time, I also got involved in the Young Scientists of Australia. And it was actually on a bus heading from here into the city during ISS 95 that we sort of re-nucleated the Sydney chapter because we realised it had sort of fizzled out a couple of years beforehand and there were enough people who were excited to do it again. And so it, on the way into the city, I think we were going to the movies that night as one of the social activities, we said, hey, let's actually organise something. And ISS 97, ISS 99, YSA started coming and running the social activities in the evenings during ISS. And we did all sorts of silly things with YSA over the years. And once again, it was science communication and it was a lot of fun. We helped out at uh, open days, we smashed things, we broke things, we blew things up. Um, you can't quite see. There's actually me in the shadow there blowing up a balloon full of hydrogen with a whole lot of uh, iron filings in it as well, which is why you get the pretty sparks. And during this thing, I've got, you meet a lot of people, you work with a lot of people, it's a lot of fun. And one of the people I met is this lovely young lady here who is now my wife and we've been married for 12 years. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? <laughs> so the International Science School and YSA and things like that were a big part of my life through uni. That then took me on and kept me involved in science and I ended up doing a PhD. I was looking at polymer synthesis and my polymer synthesis was all about the maths of the polymer synthesis. The, pol the actual chemistry was sort of already worked out. How do you join these two atoms together? What sort of chemistry is going on? That was sorted. What wasn't sorted was why it happened at the particular rates it happened, how you could control those rates, how you could tweak things, how you could exert influence over the chemistry that was going on. And that's what I was saying to find really, really interesting. So maths, computing, and some chemistry. Brilliant. I ended up at Melbourne Uni for a couple of years after that, and I started doing more and more surface science, atomic force microscopy. And that's an image that we took and we, we published in the, the journal Blood, because that's a red blood cell, the surface of a red blood cell. The surface of a red blood cell that has been tortured in a very particular way, it has malaria. And the little knobs on the surface are due to the malaria infection. And the theory was at the time, and I think it's the, the, the later evidence still supports it, that this little, these little lumps on the surface are what makes the red blood cells difficult to flow through the body and what leads to a whole lot of the nasty symptoms of malaria. So at this stage, I'm starting to do chemistry and physics and maths and now some biology as well. And obviously working with other people, particularly when it comes to blood, working with people who knew far more about blood than me, far more about the, the, the genetic manipulation that needed to be done to, to actually pull off these set, set of experiments than me. And uh, I, I made them convince me that it was safe to do this experiment because I really didn't want malaria. Thank you very much. But this was a live red blood cell when we started and we started imaging it out and we found all these little lumps on the surface. That was what that research project was about. So this sort of idea of a, of a multidisciplinary set of research crossing over all of these boundaries, that was, was where I was headed and that's what I did more and more of. Now, if you want to do research in Australia, it's pretty common, almost mandatory these days, that you go off and head somewhere else for a period of time. And I headed to the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. We went for two years, and seven years later we were still there because we were enjoying ourselves so much. The science was great, and it was a lovely city to live in. We were having a lot of fun there. So I went to the UK, and I started, worked with this particular research group because I wanted to learn about neutrons. I wanted to learn about neutron scattering, neutron reflection. And there was a fantastic research projects that we had started to develop while I was in Melbourne, and we got EU funding to actually pull it off. It's a fantastic uh, problem in polymer physics about why, why polymers have the particular shapes that they have at interfaces. 
And the way of addressing that was going to be using this sort of instrument. That's a neutron reflectometer. That's in the south of France. The, nu the nuclear reactor is in the building next door up that way. And our sample is this tiny little thing in the middle there. And that big tank you probably recognize as being the detector tank, a big evacuated tank with a detector inside it. So I spent seven years in Bristol, had a fantastic research group there that I was working with, and eventually ended up coming back to Australia a couple of years ago, and I'm now at the University of New South Wales in chemical engineering. And the sorts of things that I do now is still this, comp this composition of chemistry and physics and maths and fluid flow. I showed you that one of these, a video of this emulsification process at work yesterday. Here's some still images of what we make in the end. We make these beautifully crystalline, very, very uh, evenly dispersed droplets of, of oil in water in, a, in an emulsion. We make use of these to help us then study what's going on at the interface. And actually, we also make use of them to do more synthesis. We start doing synthesis around the outside of these droplets. And all of a sudden, we make beautifully templated, large-scale, crystalline solids as well. The other thing that we're, I'm still continuing to look at is polymers at interfaces, molecules at surfaces. So this problem of polymer physics that, that first took me to Bristol about 10 years ago now is something that I'm still working on because we're only just starting to understand some of the, the right answers. Um, we're actually starting to understand some of the right problems and we're starting to head towards maybe having the right answers. That's probably the more, more accurate way of putting it. Fundamentally, what we're looking at is when you start to stick large molecules at the solid-liquid interface, we know what they look like when you do nothing to them. So if we just have an individual particle floating around with polymer on the surface, we know what that looks like. Small angle scattering tells us what that looks like. But what happens if two of these particles collide? The reason for putting the polymer on the surface was to make the particles repulsive, to uh, offer a lubricating layer between two surfaces, to prevent maybe a protein fouling the surface. These are the reasons why we start trying to change the nature of surfaces, but we don't fundamentally know what the surface looks like in all of these non-equilibrium, these perturbed conditions. We know what the system looks like, in equilibrium, infinite dilution, if you like. And that's great, and that's wonderful, but it's not actually very useful for knowing what to do next. So this is what we've been pursuing. We've pursued it in, in, in Bristol, and I'm continuing to pursue it now, to try and understand more about how we can modify surfaces and why surfaces have the properties that they have. So back to our story. Our story now is going to start talking about surfaces. Our story is going to start bringing together our ideas about molecules and the tools that we were playing with. So the big tool, the big toy in our to toy chest at the moment is a nuclear reactor. And it has neutrons pouring out of it and they go thundering down neutron guides that you saw. They hit samples, they hit detectors. So that's what we did yesterday. This far right-hand edge, measuring our products. What we now want to do is cover some of this material in the middle doing a bit of chemistry and working out what it is that we've actually made. Now, everything that we talked about yesterday, we talked about in a very, very crystalline fashion. We made these beautiful diffraction patterns because we had things that had a lot of regular ordering. We had big meshes of di different symmetries, or we had crystalline DNA, for instance. And that gave us beautiful, beautiful diffraction patterns with high symmetry and lots of bright spots. So the question for us then is, what happens when we don't have something that has beautiful symmetry? Do we still get scattering? We should. The, the physics of the scattering is still happening. It's just not happening in a beautiful regular array anymore. So if it's not happening in a beautiful regular array, how is it happening and how do we get some information out of it? Well, this is actually just asking an age-old question. Why is the sky blue? Why, if we pop down on a lovely blue sky day to the beach, and I had to explain to English students that this is what a blue sky beach looked like, you see, so I had to get, go and dig out a photo of a blue sky for them. If we went down and we found a lovely blue sky, and we could then say, why is that sky blue? As opposed to, for instance, the sky on the moon. So a picture here of Buzz Aldrin, you can see in the sky behind him is black. What's different about the sky that makes one blue and one black? It's scattering. It's the interaction of sunlight with the molecules of the atmosphere. 
And it's all the same physics. It's all the same stuff that we were talking about with light scattering, X-ray scattering, neutron scattering that we were doing yesterday, except now we no longer have really nice crystalline materials. We have a gas. We have a disordered gas with molecules flying everywhere. What's happening in our blue sky is quite simply this. We have a sun that's spitting out photons all over the place, and there's us down here on the surface of the Earth as an observer. Now, at some stage, if we go and pop in some gas molecules that will scatter into the atmosphere, light is going to hit those gas molecules, and scattering occurs. And when scattering occurs, we see that we actually have a, a characteristic shape to the scattering pattern that looks like that. And blue light would get scattered towards us, and so would red light. But the sky is not particularly white, the sky tends to be blue. The reason for that is that blue light is preferentially scattered. Shorter wavelengths are scattered more strongly than longer wavelengths. And in amongst all the work that you can do in measurement and measurement and theory development, you can find that the scattering intensity is going to be uh, the wavelength to the power of minus four. That's a really, really, really strong dependence on the wavelength. So the shorter wavelength blue stuff gets scattered preferentially, and so when we're looking up at a molecule of, uh, that's scattering, we see blue being scattered towards us more than we see red. Correspondingly, the person o over on the far horizon is seeing blue light cut out of their view, and that's why they're getting a lovely red sunset. There's a question. Why don't we see purple rather than blue in the sky? That's a, that's a great question. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is the eye's sensitivity to these colours. It varies markedly with, with wavelength. The other thing is that the, the shorter wavelengths get absorbed more as well. So there's, there's other molecules in the atmosphere, like ozone, for instance, that are there and thankfully absorb a lot of the shorter wavelengths a whole lot more. So if we keep on going down in wavelength, then we actually see that large sections of the spectrum get cut out by absorbance. So a whole lot of this work was actually developed by this man, who's known as Baron Raleigh, Lord Raleigh. That wasn't his name, a bit like Kelvin, in fact. Kelvin wasn't his name either. He was Lord Kelvin. But Raleigh was a fantastic example of what a 19th century scientist tried to do. He wasn't a chemist. He wasn't a physicist. He was a natural scientist, and he did absolutely everything. He did sound. He discovered a gas. He uh, studied earthquake waves. He thought about optics quite a lot and developed a whole lot of this theory about scattering. Uh, he developed a whole lot of fluid flow, fluid dynamics work as well. And so you find his name popping up all over the place. All of these different fields have things in there named after him because of his fantastic contributions to these fields. So John William Strutt published a beautiful paper in 1873 Three in Nature, where he described some experiments on colour. Beautiful title. There's no way that any of us could get away with publishing a paper that read like this these days. It's the most overwrought Victorian prose that you have ever seen. It is so far from scientific English that uh, it, it's, it's actually quite comical. But he had some experiments that he had done on beautiful sunny days. He had pulled apart various bits of the spectrum with reasonably crude apparatus, and he had developed this lambda to the power of four law. He also knew Maxwell, as in Maxwell's equations of, of electricity and magnetism. So he knew Maxwell, they'd corresponded about this problem of colour and light scattering quite a lot. And Maxwell actually told him, it would be far easier for you to just do this, this calculation than for me. And so, about a year later, Raleigh finally finished this particular calculation and was able to work out exactly why these properties were, what the influence was. And light scattering at about that time actually gave the first vaguely accurate measurements of what a mole is. 1915, so the, the, uh, the accepted value for a mole was wrong by about 20% still. Just didn't know. It's a really hard thing to measure. Scattering narrowed that down quite a lot, and, and later on, electrochemistry narrowed it even further. So, 
Rowley came up with a whole lot of theories about what was going on in these things, and he told us that we should see scattering. Now, I want to show you that we can actually see molecular scattering. And I want to show you a, a set of samples and talk a little bit about the scattering that we're going to see from each of these. So our first one is a lump of water. And if we shine a laser through that, you can't see very much. Right? Pretty dull, isn't it? Now, if we go and put a solution of large molecules here, so this is a solution of polymer, and we now shine our light through this, then we can start to see that we actually have a significant amount of light scattering. You can see that green stripe across the, the solution. So let's do the comparison. We can shine it through both here. So there's no scattering off just pure water, and we've got quite a lot of light scattering coming off the polymer solution. So as soon as we start to put big molecules inside our solution, we see appreciable amounts of light scattering, just as Raleigh predicts, in fact. If we make our scattering centers even bigger, so now we have little clay particles in here, you can see, in fact, that this sample is already a bit white. That's light scattering occurring. And if we go and put our laser through that, you can see that the project is barely even coping with how bright that is. That's such a bright, bright thing. Now, if we take an emulsion, and I have a, an oil in water emulsion in this thing, and we try and shine the light through that, we see that we can barely even get the light through there. If you have a look, there's absolutely no light coming through onto my hand on the other side. So light's not even making it through this emulsion at all. There's lots and lots and lots of scattering going on. The scattering is going on off the droplets. So it's, it's the oil-water interface that we've got, and it's the droplets that is causing the scattering. And there are so many droplets, there are so many interfaces, and the drops are so big that light just gets scattered in all directions, and we now have a, what we call a turbid material. We can't get light through it at all. So turbidity is actually telling us uh, exactly what we want to know about these systems. The more turbid the system is, the more material we have dispersed inside it. And the more material we have dispersed inside it, and the bigger the material is, the, 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 uh, the greater the amount of light scattering. That, incidentally, is why your glass of milk is white as well. You have light scattering occurring off all of those water-fat interfaces that you have from the fat that's dispersed in the water, which makes up your milk. Okay, so we've got a collection of scatterers, and we've got a, uh, our, uh, the ability to know something about what's going on with our system. What we want to now think about is why molecules want to start sticking to surfaces. And anisotropy, so variation in shape and size, is what this all becomes about. And one way of thinking about this is to, to start with things that are purely isotropic, purely spherical, circular things, like a, a, a soccer ball. It's the same in all directions, and it's pretty dull. If instead we go and we find an Aussie rules football, which is not completely isotropic, it has shape, it has symmetries to it, it has, has a, a, a long axis and a short axis, and there's a lot more fun can be had with an Aussie rules ball than a soccer ball. And the Victorians are cheering me on here as well. Good to see. Excellent. So anisotropy is a way of making things more interesting on the sporting field. It's also a way of making more things, things more interesting in when we start talking about chemistry. So if we start off with a little spherical helium atom, there's only so much it can do. It can fly around and bounce off other helium atoms. You can make it cold. You can make it hot, and that's about the, the limit to its repertoire. It's a bit of a one-trick pony. If, however, we start to look at anisotropic molecules, and this one down the bottom here, water, is the most amazing anisotropic molecule. It has a dipole moment. It has a, a, a distribution of charge within it. It's an asymmetrical molecule. It's a bent shape. We have pairs of electrons down here that are, are sitting there wanting to do something for us. They can do, make chemistry happen. We can get them to pair up and we can have acids and bases with this thing. It's an amazing solvent because of its chemical properties. And it has a really, really broad range over which it's a liquid up to a gas. 
So for its molecular weight and size and stuff like that, we would not expect it to be a, a liquid at a lot of temperatures when it actually is a liquid for us. And that's all due to its anisotropy. That's due to the fact that it has uh, a distribution of charge within it and it can therefore end up bonding, hydrogen bonding, with other molecules, other water molecules around it. Now, water's an anisotropic molecule, and it does all these fancy thing, things for us, but so are things like sodium to decal sulfate, which is probably the world's most commonly used surfactant. It's not a particularly good surfactant, but it's a really, really widely used surfactant because it's really, really cheap. One of the reasons why it's really cheap, of course, is that it's really widely used. It's just economies of scale at that stage. So sodium to decal sulfate is the molecule that you probably used in your toothpaste this morning. You'll find it written down as either sodium dodecal sulfate or sodium laurel sulfate uh, in, in the list of ingredients. It will have been in your shampoo. It's in the washing up liquid. It's all over the place. It's a very, very cheap and easy to use surfactant. Fats, oils, these materials are also anisotropic materials. They also have a vaguely hydrophilic ends where we have molecules that will parts of the molecule which have uh, disparities in charge, variations in charge, polar bonds. And so we can end up having some hydrogen bonding or at least dipole-dipole bonding down one end, but then we have these oily chains down the other end. And so we can end up doing uh, experiments with these sorts of things that would, where we have molecules sticking to surfaces. Now, when we have hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules, we can start to talk about the desire for the molecule to go and find a surface. We've identified a hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end to our molecule. And quite simply, the hydrophilic end is much happier being in water. It loves water. And the hydrophobic end is much happier being away from water. And the water is much happier being away from it. And that's actually a very, very important point as well about why these molecules are going to behave the way they behave. So we have a water-hating tail, we have a water-loving head to the molecule, and we can start to do some fun chemistry with this. Right? We don't just have to make uh, these molecules with one head and one tail, we can start having branched tails, we can have several tails, we can actually have uh, paired up molecules that have two heads and two tails. And I've been told I'm not allowed to make jokes about Tasmanians when I say two heads. <laughs> So we have molecules that are going to be surface active. That means they want to head towards surfaces. And these molecules, by heading towards surfaces, are surface active agents, surfactants for short, these surface active agents are going to give us a way of changing interfaces, changing surfaces, and then we can start to really do some nice chemistry and, and do some nice control of what these interfaces look like. Now, our picture of what's going on in these things is these water molecules have bonding between them, intermolecular forces. All of this comes down to intermolecular forces. Something that I know in so year 10, year 11 chemistry, most students suffer through because they sit there and they are dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonding, van der Waals, yeah, whatever. These intermolecular forces are what drives absolutely everything that I'm talking about today. The covalent stuff's dull, that's done, that's easy. Carbon-carbon bonds is made, it's not going away. The van der Waals forces, your, hydro, your um, hydrogen bonding, your dipole-dipole interactions, those are things where the, the forces involved can be broken by heating and stirring. They can be manipulated by changing the, the, what sort of solvents you're playing with. And so that's where we start being able to tweak our system quite a lot. Question? What, uh, that hold the molecules together or hold together aggregation. So the question is, what, 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 uh, how would we describe the force in terms of physics? They're all electrostatic. Uh, the difference is whether you have permanent charges, and so you can sit down and write down a, a force or an energy as a function of the permanent charge. We have a 1 plus ion and a 1 minus ion, for instance, and you have 1 on d squared separation or whether you're talking about little dipoles that just appear and disappear temporarily. So we have electrons that are in clouds around these molecules. Sometimes the electrons are over there, sometimes the electrons are over there. And as they move around, they create, just temporarily, a tiny little distribution of charge. 
And once you get a tiny little distribution of charge, then you can have a force between your little asymmetry and charge on this molecule and your little asymmetry of charge on that molecule. And all of a sudden there's now an attraction between those two because we've got a, 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 a little dipole at both ends. And that's what the van der Waals force or dispersion force or London force is, goes by lots of different names. That's what those forces are in the hydrophobic systems, where you don't have dipoles, you just have temporary little uh, dipoles appearing for a short period of time, a little bit of attraction, but the electrons are always moving around, and so those dipoles disappear again. It's a great question. So in our water, we have lots and lots of hydrogen bonding. And lots of hydrogen bonding keeps our water molecules very happy. Remember, bonding means that the system is lower in energy. So lots of bonding means that our water molecules are overall lower in energy, they're, happy, they're a happy species. But when we get close to the surface, we see that there's an asymmetry here. We don't have nice strong bonding between the molecules in our water and the molecules in our gas, for instance, or even in the oil. We, no longer, we can't have hydrogen bonding between those species, and so we have now an asymmetry in the, uh, the, the, the intermolecular forces at this interface. Now, there's a couple of consequences of that. One is the phenomenon of surface tension. So, tension is the, uh, the uh, inability to stretch. It's the forces involved in stretching things. Well, let's have a look across this surface here. We've got all of these forces acting between neighbouring molecules, pulling those molecules together. That's a set of tensile forces. It costs us energy, we have to apply force to stretch that interface, that surface tension. Now, we want to talk about surfactants, we're going to talk about lowering surface tension. We're going to put molecules, surfactants, at the air-water interface, and all of a sudden we see that we start to change where those missing intermolecular forces are. So we provide something for the water to talk to, to have its little hydrogen bonding conversation with, by providing it with something that's hydrophilic on one end. But this same molecule, which is hydrophobic on the other end, is really happy to stick into the other phase. So these molecules want to end up heading towards the surface. And that means that changes the energy of the system quite a lot, and it allows us to make interfaces, make and break interfaces in a quite a different way. Now, when we start talking about these surface energies, we then have to think how we're actually going to prove anything about these systems. So the first thing that we can do is to think about wetting, to think about when, what happens when we try and get uh, a sample or we'll try and get a solid to come in contact with a liquid. So I have a beaker of water. Not very interesting so far, is it? And into this beaker of water, I'm going to sprinkle some sand. And we can see, if I get it just right, that a whole lot of this sand is actually just floating on the surface. So this sand doesn't want to actually wet with the water. The water doesn't want to come in contact with this sand. And the sand is quite happily sitting on the surface. OK. Now, if I pour in a whole lot more, we can see that it goes straight to the bottom. It still isn't wetting with the water. You can see all, of the, um, all of these little white dots that you can see in, around the sand is air that it has captured and pulled down into it because it really, really, really wants to talk to air and it really, really doesn't want to talk to water. Now, if I... might need to put a little bit more in there. If I now grab hold of a spoon and try and remove some of this, then we can see when it comes out, it's completely dry. I happened to pull out a couple of um, little bits of water at the same time just then. Let me have a do that again so you can see it a bit more easily. So you can see that we just have completely dry sand coming back out of this. So what we have in this system is a very, very carefully engineered surface. It's Teflon-coated sand. So we have sand that's very, very carefully engineered to not want to talk to water. It's really, really, really hydrophobic sand. And our hydrophobic sand uh, doesn't want to wet, doesn't want to interact, doesn't want to hydrogen bond. And so we can see that water does not want to talk to it. Now, 
If we were to put in some surfactant, then we would see that we change the bonding in that system quite a lot. And I'm not going to do that because that ruins my magic sand. But if we were to put some surfactant in there, we would see that we got back to a system where it wetted quite nicely. Now, we can go one step beyond this and take hold of some emulsions or some things that will, at one stage, become emulsions. And I think I want a piece of paper under that again. So these are some of the samples that I had to get Chris to run and uh, put some extra surfactant in there for me because my, my, the ones that I had brought with me had crystallised out in the cold overnight. So we have um, a couple of these samples that have surfactant in them and a couple that don't. And we just have oil and water. We have some uh, food colouring in the water phase, which is why it was scary red. And when I gave it to Chris, he looked at it and looked slightly petrified. It's fantastic fun giving chemicals to physicists. They freeze up every time. <coughs> but a couple of these have got some surfactant in them and a couple of them don't. So if we give them a quick shake, it's pretty obvious at this stage which ones have surfactant in them and which ones don't. So they all got shaken about the same amount, but we can see as the, uh, the, the system starts to phase separate, to fall apart, we see that we have a, a collection of materials where two of them are phase separating really, really quickly and have big droplets inside them. And two of them, the phase separation is occurring much more slowly. So what we've got here is a simple emulsion. Now, you've all made emulsions like this before, olive oil, balsamic vinegar, give it a shake, and you know by the time that's passed around the table, that emulsion's fallen apart. You want to get fancier, you start breaking out the egg, you start making a mayonnaise sort of thing, or various other salad dressing recipes. The egg white in that is a surfactant. Egg white is a great surfactant. And so your egg white is now going to keep your emulsion dispersed, and your dispersed emulsion is going to be much more stable for a longer time. So we can emulsify things, we can uh, make all sorts of uh, pretty pictures of emulsions, and that actually starts telling us about what's going on at the surfaces. The other way we know things about these systems is from techniques like neutron reflection. So neutron reflection is sensitive because we're doing a reflection experiment, a reflection off the interface. It's sensitive to what's on that interface. So if we're reflecting a neutron beam off the air-water interface, then we get a whole lot of information about what an air-water interface looks like, and that's pretty dull. We start lining up surfactants on that interface, just like in the little cartoon I showed earlier. We see that we have a row of heads mixed with water, a row of tails sticking out of the water and making an oily mess. We see all that sort of thing in a neutron reflect reflectometer. And here's a, a composite of uh, seven different images I took of, over the top of one of the neutron reflect reflectometers in the US. So there's actually a, a nuclear reactor down the bottom of this picture. And the neutrons have come up there, and a little bit like Wombat that you were sitting in front of in the viewing gallery, there's a crystal in here which turns the neutron beam at 90 degrees to the guide, and it comes out towards the instrument. There's a neutron guide, there's our sample sitting on the reflectometer, and there's the detector. And the neutron beam comes down, reflects off the sample, hits, hits into, the, into the, uh, the, uh, the, the detector. And curiously, the operator, me, while running these samples, sits at a desk just there. And I have to say that basic uh, sort of health physics for uh, reactor sources and the like tells you that maybe situating the person immediately behind the beam isn't necessarily the way that you would do it. But they, they seem quite happy with that, so we just didn't spend very much time there. Question? How does one guide a neutron? So mo the neutron guides are made up of... Uh, very, very finely polished mirrors made up of lots and lots of layers, lots of layers of metals. And each layer is thinly polished, fine, or very, very finely polished, another layer gets put down, and they are essentially like a reflectometer. They reflect the neutrons beautifully, uh, and over a longer and longer distance, you make them into uh, a, a sharper and sharper, more collimated beam, a more parallel beam. The crystal that's, that sits inside there is diffracting the neutrons out and you use that crystal to select the wavelength of neutron, the, 
uh, the, the particular velocity of neutron that you want to use for your experiment for in, in this particular beast here. The neutron reflectometer at ANSTO, they've actually made a nice little uh, video of, so I can actually show you what that looks like, which is great. So the neutron reflectometer at ANSTO starts off with a neutron beam coming out of the reactor, going through the moderator and being slowed down, and now it trundles along the neutron guide. Now, it finds these things called choppers, and these choppers that you can see rotating in the middle here, these choppers actually uh, chop the beam into small little segments. And now instead of looking at just uh, a single monochromatic, one wavelength of neutrons, we now look at how long each different wavelength takes to get from the sample to the detector. And that's what we're seeing there in that little animation. <coughs> now, you get data that looks like that uh, on the screen there, and yes, we, we sit at our thing and look at the screen like that while we're doing it. <coughs> we have uh, data that appears which show, which, which uh, demonstrates the structures that we're looking at, is sensitive to those structures, and gives us information about the layer, layer by layer structure going down through the, the sample. So our pulses of neutrons as they come through the system, uh, they, they're chopped up to make the pulses, and these choppers are spinning at thousands of RPM to, to chop out the, the nice little fine pulses that we want. So you can see the beam there being chopped up. It goes through slits and optics and all these sorts of things, and now we can see the, the neutron beam bounce quite happily off our sample, and then it disappears down into the, the detector tank and hits our detector, and we can measure the reflection. So that's our overall process that we're going on, going on with there. So neutron reflection, there's a huge amount of neutron reflection work has been done to measure the structures of surfactant layers at the air water interface, the oil water interface, the water solid interfaces for various different solids. A lot of beautiful work has been done using exactly this technique. Now, we've talked about surfactants going to interfaces. Surfactants going to interfaces is great, but at some stage the interface will be full. There's only so many surfactant molecules you can cram onto an interface. So by the time we fill the interface, we're going to end up having to put our surfactant somewhere other than the interface. And as we put our surfactant somewhere else other than the interface, we realize that our tails are now having to interact or not interact with the water. And so in the same way that we were having problems with lack of hydrogen bonding between water and the interface, water and air, water and oil, at the air-water interface, air-oil inter water oil interface, we're going to end up with the same problem here. Around that hydrophobic tail, the water is unhappy. It's deficient in the number of hydrogen bonds it really should have. And at some stage, if we keep on cramming in more and more surfactant, it's going to start saying, no more. And when it says no more, the, the surfactant stops being soluble and stops being distributed throughout the, the solution that we're talking to, and instead it separates out into a thing that we call a micelle. Adding more and more surfactant has become unfavorable. We can't cope with any more of these uh, water tail interactions, but if we arrange our molecules into this little ball, of surfactants, this micelle of surfactants, then we've managed to keep the water happy and we've got the tails happy as well. So by arranging our molecules into this sort of surfactant micelle, we've managed to get the tails away from the water. The water can now go and do its hydrogen bonding happiness. The oil is protected from the water. It's sitting inside this little hydrophobic, pot, little hydrophobic pocket. How do we know anything about these hydrophobic pockets? How do we know anything about micelles? Small angle scattering, small angle neutron scattering in particular. So when we look at a molecule like, or a collection of molecules like this, and we're now talking about things that are going to be maybe tens of nanometers in size and consist of tens to hundreds of molecules, these have appreciable sizes. These are the sizes where we really need small angle neutron scattering to be able to measure things about them. And the sorts of things that we would want to know, for instance, are just how big is our little aggregate of molecules in our micelle? How many surfactants do we have inside our micelle? And overall, what's the charge on this micelle? So if we're dealing with something like sodium to decyl sulfate, it's a negatively charged surfactant, it's an anionic species. So we end up with 
uh, a my cell that's carrying a whole lot of negative charge. And all those negative charges are going to repel each other. They're going to repel other my cells. And so at this stage, our my cells don't really want to approach too closely to each other. There's forces pushing them apart. And how long into the water, how far into the water those forces can be felt depends on what else is in the water. And that's, we end up with starting to get some structure within our water as well. Our micelles have to be arranged in a way where they're not too close to any other micelle. So there should be a little bit of structure starting to emerge. Next question. Yep, so it's a fantastic question. Why do my cells stay held together? So the hydrophobicity is, uh, isn't repulsive. The, the, the hydrophobicity is they're, they're happy to be assembled like that. You're right that the heads are repulsive because they're all charged potentially. What ends up happening is that you have your counter ions. So it was sodium dodecyl sulfate. So I've sort of just drawn the dodecyl sulfate bit in a lovely little cartoon fashion here. There is a sodium ion associated with that, and a whole lot of the sodium ions will actually pair up with the heads with, with, in, uh, in this sort of micelle. About half of them, roughly, end up pairing up, which reduces the amount of charge-charge repulsion that you have inside that micelle, uh, or between the heads around that micelle. The other thing is that these are really, really transient uh, structures. So each micelle only lives for about a millisecond. Each molecule, surfactant molecule within a micelle, is only in that micelle for about a microsecond. The molecules, are, these are very, very dynamic structures. Two micelles collide, they fall apart. They just spontaneously fall apart into two halves and then they reassemble with other free, micelle, free, free surfactant molecules and make a new micelle. They're very, very, very dynamic structures, just because there's not very much holding them together, as you say. So these are the sorts of things that we want to try and characterise about micelles, what they look like, how big they are, and what they do. Once we know something about these structures, we can make use of them for lots of different things. So our micelles are a little hydrophobic pocket. Our micelles are the sorts of things that can carry flavours, they can carry oils, they can carry pharmaceuticals. And perhaps now I've explained where we're going with this. Flurbiprofen is a hydrophobic molecule. I've now got little hydrophobic pockets. I've got a way of getting my hydrophobic molecule dispersed into water, and I can have a way of making it travel through water and get where we want it. Now, we can do lots of things to manipulate the sorts of micelles that we have, the size, the shape, the length, and addition of lots of other things to it, such as a little bit of uh, a, a long water-soluble polymer is one of the really common ways in, in, in consumer products of changing your micelles. And we end up with things that are called worm-like micelles because they're really, really big, long micelles. And these really, really big, long micelles form when you're not stirring the system. And so that you have these big, long, worm-like micelles which make the system really viscous because you have big, long things that are difficult to stir. If you do stir it, however, stir it just enough, you break those worm-like micelles up, because these are dynamic, transient structures. And you can break them up, and so as you stir that system, it becomes less viscous. And these worm-like micelles are pretty much what you will find in any shampoo that's a clear shampoo. And that's why it's really viscous when it's sitting in your hand and in the bottle, but you can pour it really easily because you break the worm-like micelles and it flows. How quickly do the worm-like micelles reform? It's at the same time scale as the assembly of all these other things. It's, it's down at the millisecond time scale. These are uh, very, very fast-moving little molecules for the most part. Yes, pretty much. What you're taking, so when you, if you take corn flour and water and stir that hard enough, you start to make that lock up and you've, uh, it's a phenomenon known as jamming. So you've got little granules of starch floating around. They're much bigger than these micelles. 
the, the, you've got little granules of starch that are about uh, 10 micron in size from memory. And as you stir them, you force them to collide. And when you get lots and lots of collisions, you suddenly end up with a large lump of starch. And that large lump of starch starts turning the whole thing into uh, uh, something that is solid-like. As soon as you stop stirring it quite so hard, though, then the little granules of starch have chance to, to wiggle away from each other and, and get past each other, and they're no longer jammed against each other, and so it can flow again. It's a bit like Sydney traffic, really. So small angle scattering is a way that we can start to measure the structures of micelles, of worms, of various different structures that we might make in our systems. We have a diameter, we have an aggregation number, the number of surfactant molecules in our micelle. We have the total charge in our system. And just like the diffraction patterns we've looked at before, we're going to do this with small angle scattering and we're going to get some details out of this. Now, at this stage, I'm going to show you some, some real, genuine, small angle scattering data. And uh, there'll be a test at the end on the analysis of this. No, there won't. At some stage, looking at small angle scattering data is, is a bit of a, a lost cause, because fundamentally, every single data set starts to look the same. It starts high on the left-hand side, ends up low on the right-hand side. And most samples just sort of gracefully go from high to low, and there's not much in it. But in amongst our small angle scattering, there is a whole lot of data. And what I wanted to just pull out and just start to show you the flavor of the sorts of analyses that we do with these, with these systems. So fundamentally, at the core of small angle scattering is, particularly if, if we're working at dilute systems, we can say that we have what's called a form factor. Some maths that describes the shape. So the maths of a, that describes a sphere. And the, the, uh, the form factor for a sphere is something that, particularly if it's a, a large distribution of sizes of sphere, we have this little red line here going down. That's what a sphere on its own would look like. Now, does that look like the experimental data we've got? Not really. So there's something more to our system than just a set of spheres. What we also can get out of our small angle scattering is this spatial arrangement where the micelles are relative to each other. I'm not claiming that the micelles are beautifully arranged in a crystal throughout the, uh, throughout the fluid. That's, that's most definitely not the case. But the micelles all have charge. These, these are, this is scattering off these exact same SDS micelles. These micelles have charge, charges repel, and so you're much less likely to find two micelles close to each other than you are to find them just a little bit further away. And so our overall fluid starts to have some structure to it. We have a structure factor, a mathematical description of the fact that we are unlikely to have two micelles really close, and as we go further away, we're more likely to find micelles. And our structure factor describes that force. It actually describes the energy of bringing two things closer to each other. And so by the time we start to talk about micelles and charge-charge repulsion, and we do a lot of maths, we would end up predicting a structure factor that looks like this little wibbly line. Now, our small angle scattering pattern is the product of these two things. So by the time we multiply them together, we end up with this little uh, light blue hump, and you can see that that is looking like our experimental data. So we have information about the size and the shape. We, could, we have information that these micelles are spherical. We have information about how big they are, and the radius of these micelles was, was 3.8 nanometers. We have information about how many molecules there are to, that are required to make up that 3.8 nanometers, and the answer is about 80 molecules in these, 80 individual surfactant molecules in these micelles. And we have information about what the overall charge on this particular micelle is. And there's about 17 electrons worth of charge floating around on this micelle, as opposed to the, the, all of the SDS molecules being ionized. So we have information about this long-range structure and the charge-charge repulsion. We have information about the size. We have information about the shape. And so we can get out of something like small angle scattering really quite a lot of information. What you can see, however, is that I've just looked at a small angle scattering 
plot like that. And fundamentally, I mean, it just went up and it went down. And I've told you this beautiful, convincing story about that's what an SDS micelle looks like. And you've all sat there dutifully and gone, oh, wow, yeah, I've written it down. It's great. The trouble is, though, that these sorts of measurements are really not very direct measurements. The problem is that we're looking at a funny trace like that and trying to infer what the system really looked like. This is the same problem that we were talking about yesterday with Rosalind Franklin. She had the beautiful X for the diffraction of DNA and then had to try and work out what crystal structure would make that particular X. And that's a hard problem. So when we're looking at a dragon, it's really easy to say these are the tracks it would make. We look at its feet. That's the easy problem, the direct problem. If you, know what you're, you, if you know the answer that you're trying to find, you can work out what you're going to get. The indirect problem, the small angle scattering problem, is a bit of the opposite. You have a set of tracks, and they look a little bit like that. And now you have to infer what the dragon looked like. What you can do is hypothesize a set of different dragons and see if they would make the tracks that you've just observed. And that indirect problem, that's hard. So you hypothesize, are my micelles worm-like micelles? No, that scattering doesn't fit worm-like micelles. Are my micelles ellipsoidal? No, that scattering pattern doesn't fit ellipsoidal micelles. Are my micelles spherical? Yes, the scattering pattern fits ellipsoidal micelles, etc. It's this iterative process where you try and find a plausible, uh, a plausible dragon that explains the tracks that you've got. Uh, a combination of both. When it comes to trying out all the different models, you've got to try them and you need uh, the brains of a human to sanity check whether that's a reasonable thing. Because it's not just a matter of picking the right model, it's also then you've got to tweak around the, the size, the number of electrons, the shape, the salt concentration, the total concentration of surfactants and all these other things to, to see if you can, with enough persistence, start to make that data look like, the, uh, the, the, make that, that, uh, that tracks sensible for that particular dragon. Once you get close to having the right answer, then yes, the computer can, can take it away for you and, and tweak down the last few decimal places on your fitting. Yes, that's exactly what we've got to do. We need to have information from other experiments already. So we, we know that these micelles are normally spherical because we've done some other sort of experiment, perhaps. Or we know that they're roughly four nanometers in size already because we've measured the diffusion coefficient of the molecules, something along those lines. So we, 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 we need a little bit of extra input data, which helps make this process a little bit bigger. That reduces the number of different types of drag and you've got to try to be able to answer that question. Yep. So once we start talking about of, uh, of molecules, we now have the ability to play with lots and lots of different sorts of aggregates. And we've just looked at this micellar phase, and if we had the right sort of micelle or the right sort of uh, surfactants in oil, then we could make a, a reverse micelle where the, the tails are pointing outwards and the heads are pointing inwards. We can make these rod-like micelles, which is sort of a smaller version of the worm-like micelles we just talked about. And then we can make all these other sorts of uh, structures as well. And we're starting to delve into what we would call liquid crystals in these sorts of things. So liquid crystals are essentially surfactant molecules that have aggregated in the right way for you and have formed beautiful structures. They're still liquids. You can stir these and make them flow around and the like. And they're crystals because they've got these beautiful crystal shapes. They interact with light, and that liquid crystal interacting with light is what's the display in your phone, and what's the, the display in your watch, etc. So liquid crystals interacting with light is something that's a, a really powerful tool for us. We can make these liquid crystals out of lots of different materials, not just little surfactant molecules. We can make them out of various different fats and oils and various other th things that we would synthesize. But fundamentally, what we can do with these things is quite a lot of different, make quite a lot of different structures. So what we're really talking about at this stage is a process that's described as self-assembly. We've started off with a collection of molecules, 
and we have a, a bucket of molecules and we want to know what they look like. We've taken our bucket and if self-assembly has worked, the molecules have done what we wanted and they've formed the structures that we wanted. So unsuccessful self-assembly still looks like a bucket of molecules. Successful self-assembly is when your bucket of Lego has spontaneously formed your wonderful little starfighter thing. That's what we're talking about at the molecular scale. Self-assembly. Your bucket of Lego, your bucket of molecules turning into the thing that you just wanted. And that's a pretty amazing thing to pull off. So self-assembly is the sort of the broad term that we would use to describe the formation of these molecules. And the, the self-assembly of the particular set of polymers is what we actually used to play with fluviprofen. So these polymers, long spaghetti-like molecules, we made out of three parts. Water-soluble parts and much less water-soluble parts. So these things are surface active. They're going to be a polymeric surfactant. And we can make them form big balls of, uh, of, of micelles. So we have a little hydrophobic pocket in the centre. And we can take this down to the neutron scattering centre and do neutron scattering on our hydrophobic pocket with our, our polymeric micelles. And we can start to learn about whether fluviprofen wants to go into the centre of these things and whether it's going to behave, behave for us. So what we do in our analysis is, once again, we've got a model, we've got a picture, our dragon, our hypothesised dragon, and we pull apart that mathematically to try and fit our data. All our data for these systems starts looking a bit like this curve here, and the big thing I want to talk to you about is this vertical height here, the, diff the difference in height between the, the left and the right. There's lots of other things there that are tweaked around with various different parts of our model, but that's the big one. The amount of polymer that's actually going to be in our micelles. Do we have micelles or not, really? Do we have free polymer in solution or do we have micelles? And what we find is that, yes, we can make lots of micelles and we can make different sized micelles depending on which exact polymer we play with. Whether, how much of this hydrophobic block we have changes the overall size of our, our micelles. So we have a whole lot of control over this system by, by tweaking our polymer around. And as we change the, uh, the size and the shape of our molecules, as we fiddle around with our system, we've made now polymer micelles containing fluviprofen. How do we know that? How do we know the fluviprofen's in there? Well, it's this red trace down the bottom. In amongst all the others, it's this red trace down the bottom. So in the absence of our fluviprofen, we have something that's telling us we have very few micelles. We have a lot of free polymer. We don't have enough polymer in there, and the particular temperature that's at isn't conducive to, to, to micellization of this polymer. But when we stick our really hydrophobic drug in, that red line there goes up and joins all the other ones where there's stacks of micelles. The difference in height between this one and this one, that's the fraction of polymer in the micelles. So in pulling apart our small angle scattering data, what we've been able to say is yes, we've made micelles and we've made more micelles by adding in our fluviprofen. So our fluviprofen is actually good in that it promotes more micellization and that's really nice for us for, for being able to use this practically. So we've done a lot of study on, on this particular system. This is just a, a taste of some of the things that we've looked at. And as I said, I'm not going to expect you to analyse all the finer details of this, this particular set of data. But I will actually point, to, point out to you when you're looking at this data, there's the coloured symbols and then there's a black line. So the black line is what we would predict for our, the, the scattering to come from the particular dragon we have hypothesised. We've taken our dragon, we've calculated the scattering from that, and that's the black line going through the points. And when it goes through the points like that, we go, yes, that's good. When it doesn't go through the points, we go, oops. And that's a good sign that we either need to do more experiments, we need a different shaped dragon, or we somehow need to change our system in some other way. So, adding in our hydrophobe, adding in our fluviprofen has changed our micelles quite a lot. We've promoted micellization. And that's a great way of encapsulating and distributing a whole lot of different things in flavours, fragrances, oils, monomers for synthesis, and our pharmaceuticals that we're talking about here. 
Now, I promised you some real chemistry, and I was talking to a couple of the Kiwis yesterday, and they were telling me that they'd been doing a sterification. So I thought I would show you a genuine bit of chemistry and a genuine little bit of a sterification that we did as part of this project as well. And here in the middle of this, we have an ester coupling reaction. We have the esterification going on here. And what we've made is a molecule that has this dirty, great, big hydrophobic backbone to the molecule. And hanging off it, coupled on with this esterification reaction, we've added on a stack of uh, more water-soluble polymers. So this thing is a comb polymer, a hydrophobic backbone with some floppy water-soluble stuff at various different places along it. And that molecule as well mycelizes beautifully. And we can dissolve up various different drugs like fluvoprofen, like ibuprofen, like caffeine, like nicotine. We can dissolve it up into this system really easily and it distributes it and carries it around very nicely for us. So by the time we have some flexible chemistry and we can make a funky molecule that looks like this thing here, hydrophobic backbone, hydrophilic side chains, we can force this molecule to turn into all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Just by playing with solubility, just by playing with intermolecular forces, those things that you all told me at the beginning you sort of didn't think very much of because they get rammed down your throat in year 10 chemistry, by playing around with intermolecular forces, we can make these sort of flower-like micelles where the, the backbone is soluble. We can start to assemble down into various different polymeric micelles. We've got a huge amount of flexibility in our chemistry now with that. So, how do we deal with fluvoprofen? We deal with fluvoprofen with self-assembly. We make various different micellar structures, and our various different micellar structures have given us shapes and sizes and aggregates, which allows us to get a hydrophobic molecule and to move it to the places we want. And that's why a chemical engineer wants a nuclear reactor. Thanks very much. That's not the best argument for the world's most awesome Christmas present. I don't know what.